Are you able to see it? Perfect. Yes. Okay, awesome. So I guess today's workshop will be on linear classification. And this follows up on the previous workshop on linear regression. And yeah, uh, so let's begin. So let's talk a bit about what is classification just in general. But before that, let's review a quick summary of the previous workshop. So in linear regression, we want to be able to estimate a value of a continuous variable based on different feature variables that are provided. So a continuous variable is any value within a range. So for example, we have uh, hours studied, which are the features, and we want to predict the test score. And the test score can be any value between 0 and 100. So it can be 50, it could be 50.5, it could be 50.45. It depends on uh, what the features are, and we can predict any single value within 0 to 100. And then, like, and that could be many, many values. And classification is a bit different because we want to use the input features to identify a category or group that it belongs to. And the classification model predicts a variable from a discrete set of values. So, and that's the difference. In linear regression, we have a continuous set of values, continuous set of values, but classification, we have a discrete set of values. So in regression, we can predict any value of, for example, like the previous example was from zero to 100. So it could be 50, 50.5, 50 50.55. 50 but in uh, classification, we have a specific set of values that we can predict. So for example, uh, pass or fail. So does the student pass the exam or fail based on uh, different uh, input features? Is it is an email spam or is it not spam? So we have two categories and we have to predict based on those two categories. For example, we have an image. Is it a cat or a dog? And just overall image classification, that's a lot of different types of problems. For example, a picture of an animal, which kind of animal? Is it a cat, dog, mouse? So uh, there's lots of different options that we have to select. But the important thing to know in classification, there's a discrete set of values. So in, in an image, there's only a list of specific things that it can be within that image that we predict. And there's a lot of different yes or no kind of questions that we can use classification to, uh, uh, to predict different values. So even like in the spam versus not spam, is an email spam or is it not spam? And that's, a, that's an example of a yes or no question. But I just put that there because there's lots and lots of different possibilities that we can use classification, uh, different algorithms for classification to solve. And there's different kinds of classification. There's binary classification, and that's when we have two groups and we're trying to predict one of the groups. So for example, is an exam, or is a student going to pass an exam or are they going to fail an exam? Is it spam or not spam? So different kinds of yes and no questions where we only have two values and we have to predict or from which we have to predict. We also have multi-class classification where we predict more than two or from more than two values. So for example, based on our study, is the mark going to be an A, B, C, D, or an F? is we have an image of an animal. What kind of animal is it? And like there could be a list of different animals. Just the important part that there are more than two options that we have to predict from. And multi-class classification is done a bit differently, but it builds off of binary classification. And we're going to uh, talk a bit more about multi-class at the end of the workshop. And I'm going to give you a couple examples. Yeah, so for binary classification, we want just to find one linear decision boundary to separate the two kinds of points. So we have class one and class two. And we just want to separate using a linear decision boundary if it's linear classification. There's other algorithms, but in linear classification, we want to separate class one and class two. For multi-class, we have multiple lines to because we want to separate each class from each other. Yeah, and now I'm going to talk a bit more about linear classification, which is uh, one way to predict values for classifying into different groups. Of course, there's more stuff like neural networks, which isn't considered linear classification, but it can also be used uh, to classify different things. 
Yeah, so what are the different types of linear classifiers? There's uh, two kinds. So then there's the generative models and then there's the discriminative models. So kind of as the name suggests, generative models, we look at how the data was generated. And from that, we try to model the joint probability distribution uh, together. So we model the probability of class and features. And from that, we infer what is the probability of a given class or what is the probability of a class given that those features. And we infer that from the probability distribution. Whereas discriminative models, we just look at how can we best distinguish between the two different classes? Or if there's more, more classes, it's just in general, how do we distinguish between the data? And there we are directly modeling the probability of a, of a class given the features. Whereas in generative models, we infer that from the probability distribution. Just some examples of generative models, we have linear discriminant analysis, which assumes uh, Gaussian uh, conditional density models. And we also have naive base classifiers and that there's different kinds. There's some based on Gaussian, multinomial and Bernoulli distributions. We also have discriminative models, uh, which we will touch on today. And that's logistic regression is what we'll be looking at shortly. We also have support vector machines and perceptron. And I guess some of you may be wondering, which one do we use? And kind of like a lot of things in machine learning and neural networks, it, the answer is always, it, it depends. It depends on your data. There are situations that generative models might be uh, better. And then there are situations where discriminative models might be better. Uh, for example, like generative models, when you don't have lots of data, uh, modeling the probability or using the probability distribution could be beneficial. That's just one scenario, but different scenarios require uh, different models. Or it's, it's good to test though multiple, but you, some, sometimes there's models that work better for certain scenarios than others. Yeah, and just uh, we're gonna walk through logistic regression, which is a type of, or which is one of the discriminative algorithms. So we have this problem where we have different hours studied and we want to classify, is it a pass or fail? So here we have low, low amounts of hours studied, and here we have high. Of course, we can draw a single line, but that might not work well if we have some points that are shifted far out to the right or far out to the left. It could uh, skew the line and mess up some of the predictions in the middle. So what we uh, choose is a sigmoid function or a logistic function. And it, it's kind of an S-shaped function where it asymptotes at the bottom and asymptotes uh, at the top, uh, or asymptotes at the bottom left and asymptotes at the top right. And it allows us to nicely model the probabilities. And using this logistic function or sigmoid function, we want to use the input features and output a value between zero and one to output a probability. And kind of similar to linear regression, each feature has a, an associated weight where, and here in, in the following slides, we'll represent the weight as a W. And if you look at some YouTube videos or other resources, sometimes the weight vector is represented as a theta, but they mean the same thing. Yeah, and we want to express the probability. So we basically take uh, something similar to how you did linear regression where we have the weights transpose multiplied by the feature vector x, and we just pass it through a sigmoid function. And the reason this is nice is because we can uh, model that if the prob if we look at class one and the probability is greater than 0 0.5, and it's going to be positive, so we can classify it as class one. If it's negative, we classify it as class zero. So the sigma function is really nice because the 0 0.5 decision boundary lets us model the probabilities really nicely because if something is a probability greater than 0 0.5, then we classify it as class one. And if it's lower, then we classify it as class zero. Oh, and here, just going back to the slide, this is the function is basically one over one plus uh, e to the negative weight vector transpose multiplied by the x vector. 
And if we take this uh, weight vector, we can uh, plot uh, the linear decision boundary. So that's how we would plot the line at the end to separate all the points. So to perform logistic regression, we kind of want to find the model that will maximize, the, maximize the likelihood of the samples being labeled correctly. So for samples in class one, we want to estimate the weight vector such that the probability of a class uh, or class one, given the features, is as close to one as possible. And for class zero, we want to estimate the weight vector such that one minus the sigmoid of the weight vector transposed multiplied by the feature vector is as close to one as possible. And the relation basically is that uh, one minus sigmoid, uh, one minus the sigmoid of the weight vector transpose multiplied by x is the same thing as predicting the prob probability of class zero. And just like you had in linear regression, a cost function, we have the same thing here. The cost function is different from linear regression because we want to uh, maximize the number of classes that are correctly classified or the number of points that are correctly classified. And I'm not going to go into how this was derived. There's lots of great resources online, but I don't want to uh, get into that too deep right now. But there's this: we have the cost function, and that's what we want to minimize as we're trying to find the best weight vector for our given problem. And this slide was taken out of the previous workshop on linear regression, where uh, Kwa and Victoria, they walk you through gradient descent. And the same thing is here. We make an initial guess that the model weights. And this guess could be random weights. Sometimes people use uh, normal distribution to initialize the weights. and it doesn't, or it could matter, but the point is that we make an initial guess at the weights. And from there, we compute the cost function j using that given set of weights. And from there, we compute the gradient or slope of the cost for each of these weights. And every iteration, we try to update the weights so we minimize the cost function. And we use a learning rate alpha to do so because we don't want to go. Uh, uh, we don't want to go too much or too little in a certain direction. So we play around with alpha, which is considered a hyperparameter. And that's different values that you can test out. And we repeat steps two to four until a good enough solution has been found. So the idea is we start somewhere here, and we use the gradients to uh, change the weights so that they help us reach the minimum of the cost function j. And I guess some of you may, may be wondering, what is good enough? And good enough is another hyperparameter that you need to decide when you're training the model. And that is going to dictate when you stop. If you stop too early, then the gradient might not be, uh, or you might not be finished using gradient descent. But if you stop, if you keep going with gradient descent too, uh, too long, then you might risk overfitting your data into your, to your training data. So you want to play around with that value, see which value results in the best uh, performance of the model. Uh, so now that we kind of talked about logistic regression, I want to expand it a bit more to multi-class classification. So what we just talked about works for binary classification. For multi-class, it's very similar, just a little bit of extra steps. So what, where can multi-class be used? So that's where you're trying to predict out of a discrete set, which has more than two things. So for example, you're trying to predict the weather. Is it sunny, raining, snowing, or cloudy? You're trying to predict, for example, an animal inside a picture. Is it a cat, dog, bird, or tiger? You're trying to predict the facial expression. Is someone in the picture happy? Are they sad? Are they angry? Or for example, you have a picture of a flower. Is it a tulip rose or other type of flower? So anywhere where you're predicting more than out of a set of more than two things, you want to use multi-class classification. And what we do for this is that we use a one versus all method. So for each class, we train a binary classifier where that binary classifier, uh, all the items from that class, we say that's part of class one. And any samples not from that class, 
we say that's part of class zero. So if we go back here, we would train a binary classifier. So for example, the weather problem. If we were trying to train a one versus all algorithm, we'd start with the sunny class. We would say we would train a binary classifier where the sunny uh, samples are class one, but the raining, snowing, and cloudy samples are class zero. And then we would do the same thing for raining, where we would train a classifier where all the raining samples are class one, but the sunny, snowing, and cloudy samples are class zero. And then we would repeat it for snowing, and then we would repeat it for cloudy. So what happens is that we train n different class class classifiers resulting or n different n different classes will result in n different binary classifiers. And to make a prediction, we just select the class i that maximizes the probability. And that's this probability is given by the sigmoid function. So for example, if we go, if we train a classifier for each sunny, raining, snowy, and cloudy, then we and we want to predict the new value, we would pass that new value into each of the classifiers. So we pass it into the sunny classifier, we would pass it into the raining classifier, snowing classifier, and cloudy classifier, whichever one of them returns the highest probability of it being that class, we select it, and that, that's going to be our prediction. Yeah, and in this formula, or where the weight vector, that's going to be different for each classifier, because for each classifier, we're going to be separately performing gradient descent to choose the best weight vector that models uh, th that problem. So for example, here we have this data, and we want to train a one versus all classifier for this data, we would first train a classifier where we would predict the pink dots. Then we would train another classifier where we would try to predict the blue dots. And then we train a last classifier to predict the yellow dots. Yeah, and that's kind of the end of just a quick, brief breakdown of logistic regression and linear classification. And some of the references I used for uh, this presentation and I recommend you, if you want to learn more about this in more in depth, I recommend you check out the machine learning course. Uh, it's on Coursera, it's very good. And then there's also a good series on YouTube by StatQuest that's very good at explaining uh, linear classification as well. Uh, yeah, and soon we're going to uh, walk you through a, a code example. But yeah, if you have any questions, We'll have office hours next week at the same time. And I highly suggest you check out the upcoming Kegel competition where the top three spots can win money prizes. Thanks, Alain. Uh, very nice presentation. Just let me uh, share my screen for now. You guys see my screen? Are you guys able to see my screen? Yep, yep. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Making sure. All right, so like, uh, yeah, as you saw in the presentation, uh, classification is basically just the task of uh, using information uh, in the form of features to predict some class or category. Um, and yeah, so logistic regression is just one of the simpler uh, methods for linear classification. Uh, we're actually going to use the logistic regression model from scikit-learn today. And I'll just walk you through a few code examples uh, just so we get familiar with it. Right, so uh, basically the first step for any machine learning uh, or programming task is to set up our environment. So in this case, I'm using a Jupyter notebook uh, so we just basically need to import all the libraries that we need. Uh, and also we're going to need to get access to the data set that we want to perform classification on. So you see here uh, that I have a cell specifically for upgrading uh, scikit-learn. So this notebook actually exists on Google Colab, which is a very convenient coding environment, which has uh, all the libraries you would typically need. Uh, they're all downloaded by default on Google Colab. So you can think of say TensorFlow or, or NumPy, PyTorch, Pandas, these are already all available on Google Colab, but you know, by no means are they the latest versions, they just all work together. 
So uh, updating scikit-learn here is not actually necessary to do logistic regression or anything. Uh, I personally just do it because I want access to all the new bells and whistles with version 1.0 of scikit-learn. Uh, in this case, I just wanted better integration with pandas data frames, which you'll see later. So I'll run that. Uh, and whenever you update a dependency, you typically have to restart your environment, but I already did it here. So we can skip ahead. Uh, so these are the libraries we're going to be using for today's uh, coding example. I have Plotly, which is a interactive and aesthetic plotting library, in my opinion. Uh, I'm personally actually a big fan of using Plotly for plotting uh, over other libraries like matplotlib or cbarn simply because it's interactive but you know <clears throat> you'll find a lot of similarities or parallels with any plotting library so you, you should use whatever you're comfortable with uh numpy here uh, hoping we're all familiar with that by now i'm just using it for matrix and vector computations and then from scikit-learn i'm importing the logistic regression from the linear module uh, linear model uh, module so this is what we're going to be using uh, to perform logistic regression and I'm also going to import the data sets module, which will give us easy access uh, to our data set. So I'll run that. Uh, so that's basically finishing setting up our uh, environment. And now we need to download our data set. So the data set I'm going to be using today is the, the IRIS data set, which you may have heard of before. Uh, it's basically one of the most popular uh, data sets you'll find in any machine learning tutorial on uh, any classification task. Uh, it's quite popular. You'll find it even on documentation uh, for any machine learning library like TensorFlow or PyTorch. It's pretty ubiquitous. Um, so this particular data set available from scikit-learn basically consists of uh, three classes or three types of flowers, irises. It includes measurements like the length and width uh, of the petals and the sepals, which hopefully allow us to differentiate between flower species. So in this case, it's a one line command to download this data set. Uh, this as frame equals true here. This is only available in version 1.0, and this basically just loads your data uh, into a pandas automatically instead of NumPy. That's why uh, I uploaded or I upgraded scikit-learn earlier. So it wasn't really that necessary. Uh, <clears throat> so now that we've set up our notebook, it's actually important to explore and get familiar uh, with their data set. So I've listed a, a few important things that we need to keep in mind here. So for example, um, we're going to need to know how many classes we have, uh, how many samples we have, how many features, uh, and more. And the answers to these questions, uh, these actually can drastically affect how we go about approaching uh, our problems. So it's always important to you know, always, always get familiar uh, with our data. And I actually give a few more examples here. So one example is uh, we need to investigate whether there's a class imbalance or not. Uh, this means whether we have uh, so many samples of one class, but only a few uh, of another class. And this will go uh, affecting about how we evaluate our classifiers. So for example, if I'm, uh, if I'm testing, say, 100 people for COVID, and 99 of those people don't have COVID, but one does, if my classifier will always predict negative, we'll have a 99% accuracy rate, which sounds very good, but doesn't really mean anything, right? Because our classifier doesn't actually uh, predict both classes. And so more things you need to investigate are uh, whether we have bad data. So by this, I mean like non-numerical data, missing data, things that don't work with our classifier. So all these things means that uh, we need to come up with some strategy to clean or modify uh, our data set for our needs. And uh, personally, I find this to be the most annoying and boring part of any machine learning project, but it's, uh, it's really a necessary evil. Uh, and we also have a workshop, uh, upcoming uh, workshop on this topic pretty soon. So anyway, this all shows how I might go about uh, investigating our data set. By no means is this the, the only way. There are probably about 10 or 20 different ways to get the same answer, but this is just how I did it. So I'll just run that. I can count the number of classes by looking at the targets uh, listed in the IRIS dictionary we got from our uh, data set module given by scikit-learn. And like we saw previously, there's three species we care about, Satosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. Uh, irises. I can also count uh, how many samples we have, just looking at the length of our data frame. Uh, I can also use the value counts uh, pandas function to see how many of each class that we have. In this case, we find that we have a pretty balanced data set, 50 uh, per class, which is pretty nice. 
And I can also see how many features we have by looking at the uh, feature object of our Iris dictionary given by scikit-learn. And we see here we have four. In this case, we have the sepal length, sepal width, petal length and petal width. Um, yeah, by no means, uh, I'm not really a flower expert, but the sepal is basically just the uh, the leaves that cover the petal. They're usually green, so they're like right underneath the actual flower. And so uh, with us all, all this in mind, it's basically, uh, it's customary to look at a few examples of what we're working with. So this is pretty easy to do using pandas. We can look at the first five examples here. Uh, and a quick glance at this basically just tells us that we have four features like we discovered before, and they're all numerical, which is nice. So we don't have to convert them. Uh, we don't have to convert, for example, like string descriptions to, to numbers and vice versa. Uh, we can also get a better idea of what values we can expect for each feature using uh, the pandas describe function. Uh, so I'll run that. And yeah, and so the count here basically tells that we actually have uh, measurements for all uh, all samples, which is pretty good. We don't have any missing data. Uh, and we actually see that our values are typically between, uh, you know, like one centimeter uh, to six centimeters, which means that there isn't really a large uh, difference in our values, which is pretty nice as well for classification. Which is why this iris data set is pretty popular, is everything's all nice and cleaned up for you. So looking at these numbers is uh, all well and good, but you know some things are just easier to see when they're plotted for us to look at. And so we can take a look at the distributions of our features, which is always a good idea to plot. I typically use uh, distribution plots to uh, identify features that might be useful for classification. So here I plotted the uh, sepal length of all their flowers. And you can see that virginica flowers usually have longer sepals than, oh, what's this red one? Versicolor. And then these ones will usually have uh, longer sepals than uh, virginica flowers. So we find that this feature is actually pretty good at this uh, discriminating our classes. So this is probably a useful feature to use. Uh, yeah, useful feature for us to identify a flower. So here's a distribution for the the next feature, which in this case is sepal width. Uh, and you can see here that for these two classes, I believe these are Versicolor and Virginica, they pretty much overlap, which basically tells you that these two flower species, uh, they typically have the same sepal width. So if we're only given sepal width, it's going to be hard for us to differentiate between these flowers. But it's also good at differentiating uh, Satosa irises. So this, might, it's somewhat, this one is like somewhat useful. Uh, but it's not enough to discriminate between all three classes. And yeah, this is the next one. This one is petal length. Same deal here. It's really good at uh, discriminating setosa. So these values would typically, uh, setosa flowers usually have a smaller, smaller petal compared to the other two classes, which is good for us and good for our classifier. And this is just the last one, uh, petal width. Same idea. These are all pretty good. Uh, another benefit of plotting these distributions is that it lets you see outliers. So I, I made this easier to see using box plots here. These are marked as outliers, I believe using the IQR uh, times three rule, but there's many different rules for uh, determining outliers. So uh, this may not have been so easily apparent just looking at the numbers. Uh, usually when you come across cases like these, uh, you actually have to think about removing the outliers, um, maybe changing them. There's a lot of things that you actually have to consider when you come across these uh, cases. Uh, most importantly, you have to think about why these cases were here in the first place. So the IRS data set, the researchers actually went out by hand uh, and measured these flowers. So it could have been human error or these flowers could have just been you know, freaks of nature. We don't really know. So before you do anything to the outliers, uh, it's really important to investigate why they're there. In this case, uh, it's pretty simple. We're just going to ignore them. I don't think they're going to pose much problem to our classifier, so we'll just leave them in. All right, so that was our distribution plots. Uh, another good visualization that we can do is pair plots, which you may have heard of before. So these basically let us see how our features interact together and how they can help us uh, discriminate between classes. Um, so for example, you can see here uh, in this plot, sepal width versus sepal length is very good at discriminating setosas, the purple, but it's not so good at discriminating between uh, the other two, Versicolor and Virginica. And you compare this to maybe the interaction between petal width and sepal length, and you see that you get these nice distinctive uh, clusters. 
So a combination of these two, two features is really good at discriminating uh, for us to do three-way classification. All right, so that's basically all we've done for exploring our data. Now we can actually go ahead and perform logistic regression. We didn't see anything that would convince us that logistic regression would have been a bad idea. On the contrary, uh, based on what we've seen in these pair plots uh, in our data, it seems logistic regression will work just fine. So this is, uh, I'm gonna, first I'm gonna consider the simple case, which is binary classification uh, using only two features. Um, I believe I chose sepal length and petal length uh, based on how good they were at discriminating. Uh, and I also pretended that we only collected data on Satosa uh, and Virginica flowers. So if I go ahead and remove those, uh, you see that any two combinations of these uh, features are actually going to be very good at discriminating between these two classes, which makes this case very simple. Uh, and simple length and petal length. Simple length and petal length. That's this plot right here. As you can see, uh, a logistic uh, regression classifier will have no trouble uh, providing a linear boundary here, decision boundary. So we can see that in action. So the first step uh, in implementing logistic regression, we got to split up our features. So Pandas made this uh, very easy for us. I basically just um, took the data provided by us for, uh, in the IRS data set. I selected only those samples that belong to Satosa or Virginica flowers. Uh, they're encoded as 0, 1, and 2, so 0 and 2. And I also selected only those uh, I'm only looking at these two features, sepal length and petal length, just, just for the simple case to make it easier to visualize. Uh, and I do the same thing, so I select the uh, the classes or the target flower uh, related to that. So we see here we have a, uh, 150. Oh, yeah, so we actually have 100 rows. So if, if you remember, uh, we had 50 samples per class. We're only looking at two classes, so we only have 100 samples. And we only have two uh, features here. So to do uh, logistic regression is actually <laughs> very easy. You just define your model here to be as logistic regression, which we uh, imported earlier from scikit-learn. And then we just fit our uh, model to our features and our targets. And this will basically do everything that Elan described earlier, which is uh, you know the gradient descent, uh, using the optimizer to uh, minimize this negative log probability. This is all done here. And that was pretty quick. Then we can actually, uh, because it's a simple case, we can visualize the decision boundaries, which I'll go ahead and do. Yeah, so this was the optimal decision boundary, which maximized the uh, log probabilities. Uh, and that's all nice and well. So let's consider a, a slightly harder case, which is three-way classification using two features. Uh, this will hopefully demonstrate the multi-class example that Elan was talking about earlier. So same idea. Let's just look at sepal length and petal length, but this time we're going to include all classes. Yep, so we have 150 samples this time because we're considering all classes, but we're still only using uh, two samples. So if you look back at our uh, pair plot, actually, and I bring this one back, hopefully we'll get two decision boundaries, which will differentiate between these three classes. But let's see if Scikit-Learn can do that for us. Yeah, so it's actually uh, super simple. Again, all we have to do is provide a uh, multi-class strategy. In this case, we're using one versus rest. I believe Elan described it as one versus all. Uh, yep, but Scikit-Learn basically makes this very easy for us. And you can look at the documentation to see what other strategies they provide. They actually have a multinomial uh, strategy as well. Uh, but the important thing is that for the end user, for us, it's simply one line of code. And same thing here, we can plot our decision boundaries. And we see here that uh, it, is as, it worked as we expected. We have decision boundaries for Satosas, uh, for Versicolors and Virginicas. Uh, but because our two of these classes were sort of uh, overlapped, it's not, it's not possible to perfectly separate them using a linear boundary. That's why our accuracy is 94%. So that was uh, an easily visualizable case. Uh, and we can see we can improve that using all features this time. So this is a slightly harder case, although not really, uh, where we try to improve on this number using all available features, which was four. So this time we actually import all the features and all the samples. Same thing. Uh, I just want to stress again that scikit-learn 
does everything for us. So it's only two lines to, uh, to implement logistic regression. That's pretty quick and easy. And I can't really plot uh, 4D features. So we're just going to take a look at the score. And we actually improved by 1.3%. So all these features actually played a part in uh, discriminating between these flowers. And that was basically all that you had for today. That was logistic regression, quite simple. So if anyone has uh, any questions on either the presentation or the code, uh, feel free to just type it in chat or unmute your mic if you can and just ask. Thank you, guys. So our chat is typing right now. Thank you for attending, everyone. Just a quick reminder, I suppose, um, it's the CaseX competition that we have. Um, I, it'll be starting next semester. Um, so check it out at carltonai.com slash X, X. There'll be um, a cash prize that you can win. So if you're interested in this stuff, definitely take a look at it. We'll be having more workshops in the new semester directly related to what we're doing in CaseX. Um, and I see someone is still typing, so I will quickly just remind everyone that we're sponsored by CBA Ontario and that we have office hours next week in Discord if you're interested or have any complicated questions that might not be able to be answered here. Um, yeah, uh, that person has stopped typing, so I assume that's the end of this. Uh, um, actually, no yeah. Mystery Man is asking if the notebook will be available anywhere. I believe it'll be on uh, KSEX's or Kegel account. Is that correct, Kyle? Yeah, um, if you can put it there, that would be great. And we'll upload the slides as well to the website. So when you go back to the event page on our website, it will have two buttons at the bottom as well as the YouTube video probably tomorrow morning, depending on how good my internet is today. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. So I'm going to stop the recording here.